Hey guys, Roger Rickard here with another special edition of the Voices in Advocacy podcast, where we look back on our favorite conversations of 2021. This is a great one now with former U.S. Senator from Alaska, Mark Begich. Mark and I got together in April, and among the many items we discussed was how does an elected official make policy decisions when they are pulled in many different directions. So please sit back and enjoy my conversation with former U.S. Senator Mark Begich. Participate, engage, speak out, use your voice to be an effective advocate. The Voices in Advocacy podcast examines the diverse landscape of advocacy, exploring the ins and outs of building influence, driving change, and creating champion advocates. It's now time for the Voices in Advocacy podcast with your host, Roger Rickard. Hello and welcome to the Voices in Advocacy podcast. I'm Roger Rickard, president and founder of Voices in Advocacy, where we work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. And this is the podcast dedicated to the art of advocacy. This podcast is for the people that work and engage in advocacy efforts for their organizations, be they corporations, associations, trade organizations, and nonprofit cause groups. Now, let's get started. I am so excited about today's episode because I get an opportunity to catch up with a friend and an opportunity to introduce you and speak with Mr. Mark Begich, former United States Senator. Currently, he is the president and CEO of Northern Compass Group, LLC. Now, over the last 40 years, Mark has been a businessman, an entrepreneur, a CEO, and has led creative startups along the way. Mark has dedicated several decades of his life to public service, having served in the United States Senate representing the great state and the good people of Alaska. He has also served as mayor of Anchorage. It is an extreme pleasure to welcome Mark to today's show. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Roger. It's always great to catch up with you, sir. Now, listen, before we drill into how advocacy works, because your insight is going to be so incredibly valuable here, but before we dive into that and the work on Capitol Hill and in governing, give us a better understanding of your current firm, Northern Compass Group, and, uh, and, and what you're doing these days. Well, it's a variety of things. It's very eclectic, to say the least. Uh, you know, I'm still involved in public policy. Matter of fact, before we got on this podcast, I was on the phone with a a congressman and a senator on a project basically around infrastructure. So I'm very engaged in that aspect. But Northern Compass Group is a uh, kind of a business public policy mixed consulting group. It's kind of unusual in a lot of ways because usually you just have one or the other, business consulting or public policy, but I meld the two. And so from this, we also incubate uh, opportunities in other types of businesses. For example, we have a grocery store uh, up in Barrow, Alaska on the Arctic. It's 38,000 square foot store. We move 200,000 pounds of goods a week into the community of about 6,500 people. We sell everything from a pack of chewing gum to uh, vehicles when people ask for them. So it's a multifaceted business. We're constantly working to expand that. We also are real estate developers. So we, again, out of Northern Compass Group, we incubate some of this. Uh, as I was, I think, told you before we got on the podcast, I uh, did what I'm not sure my bankers really thought was a good idea at first, but I uh, bought a hotel in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, it's a 251 room hotel. We're renovating it, brought entrepreneurs together, but it's also a catalyst for the redevelopment of our downtown Anchorage. Along with that, the Northern Compass Group advises a variety of clients and from everything from public policy to business to startup. Sometimes we have to tell businesses that come to us that need help, that maybe they've gone too far in debt or those situations. Or we do startups where people come up with an idea. We bring capital together or ideas. And then we also advise one of the largest lobby firms in Washington, D.C., Brownstein Hyatt. I spend a lot of time, uh, everything from domestic companies to foreign governments, advising on 
business and public policy. So it's it's very eclectic. And then a couple other side projects. We own Hot Spring Developments in Carson City, Nevada, and Jemez, New Mexico. And again, expanding those during the pandemic uh, because of we're, you know, our philosophy, the people that I hire and work for me, uh, we focus on what's the long term, not the short term. You know, invest today, not for just the next six months, but what's the next six years or 10 years or 15 years. And now we employ uh, close to about 175 people. And by year's end or by beginning of next year, we'll probably be close to about 400. So we're very active. That's really exciting. And I wanted the audience to know about how eclectic everything was, because <laughs> I think it's fascinating that with your background and your knowledge set that you have, that you can, and I mean this respectfully, almost throw a dart at something and say, hey, we know how we can do this. We know what we can do better. And I can't imagine in Barrow, Alaska, what the logistics are of trying to get food and product into Barrow. With no roads, you know, yeah. so it's air transportation, weather condition, 45 below weather in the winter time. I write. And so it is, it's very interesting. And, and you're right. I think I learned that skill of kind of multitasking a variety of subject matter when I served on the Anchorage Assembly for 10 years and you had to learn a lot of different topics. But as mayor, you know, you don't get the choice to pick only, I'm going to only do public safety today or I'm going to do economic development. Every day is different. And, you know, today is a great example because the time difference of where I'm at right now because of not as much traveling that I've done. But, you know, today started at 5 a.m. Alaska time. We'll go till about nine this evening Alaska time because just the time differences. And throughout this week, I can already see my schedule. I'll be talking to folks from the embassies of Korea and, and uh, Egypt, for example, to corporations, to some civic groups, to our local mayor's race, which is happening right now. So it's a very, um, it's exciting. Every day is different. And, uh, you know, being in public policy for so many years, I can look at, you know, I'm fighting City Hall over a parking space right now uh, for a building, you know, so, uh, you know, I all the way down to that level too, let's do an infrastructure bill and spend two and a half trillion dollars and build this country back. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm honored now that you were able to take the, the time with us this week based on that schedule. I, I feel so <laughs> inferior to everything oh, you're no, doing, no. Mark, but uh, I, I greatly- well, Don't worry about it. You're doing great work out there. I know you are. <laughs> Well, thank you. Now, as a former member of the second most exclusive governing club, the U.S. Senate, yes. the most exclusive club, I, you know, of course, being the former president's club, what do you <laughs> see as two or three of the most important legislative issues confronting this Congress, the 117th? Well, I think it's critical that they keep focus, don't lose focus on the COVID issue, you know, making sure, because we're on the right, you know, point right now, you know, we were at a bad situation. We got a little bumps right now, but I think, you know, things are moving the right direction. More people are getting vaccinated. You know, I think it's important that the, the president and Congress, even the naysayers in Congress, and I do have, you know, I'm critical on them, that they need to ensure that people get vaccinated. If you're going to have the economy come back, get vaccinated, get our cities and our communities back open. That's the fastest way you can do it. So that's an important part. That next stage which they've started to do with the rescue plan that just came out but the infrastructure you and i both know i mean we just saw the rating for alaska is a c minus on our infrastructure uh there's a national rating that just came out on many of the states and in a lot of ways we as americans have neglected the investment of infrastructure we we think oh we'll put a few dollars here and it won't work but you know imagine your house right i, I can't Imagine when my hot water is making some sound, I say, I'll just put a little patch on and hope it works until you have to take that shower. And next thing you know, it's all cold water. So um, investing in infrastructure has to be, and getting people back to work must be their top priority between now and the end of the year. But then they'll have some other things that are popping up, right? You have to deal with the national defense issues that are going on around the country and around the world, really, and how they're going to address that. You got two other issues that are definitely brewing. And uh, how Congress will deal with this will be, I think, difficult. But immigration, and they're talking about gun safety again. These are two big issues. But the most important thing they cannot lose track on is get the economy moving again and don't and manage the inflation that could come out of this growth in the economy. That is number one. And if you listen to the president, uh, he doesn't deviate much on that. 
you know, even when there's a crisis here and there, they shift right back. So that's what they need to be focused on. There's a lot of other little bills they're working on, but that's number one job is COVID. Number two, get this economy moving. Then they got some other issues. Yeah. And when you were talking about the infrastructure, I remember working with the Associated General Contractors and their issues of the fact that they never knew long term how much money they were really going to have to do that's a project. Right. So, you know, here's a one year little deal. That's like turning around and saying, here's some scotch tape and some Elmer's glue, and uh, we'll let you know next year if you get any more money for more glue. That's right. This is actually a very important point, and that is um, the discussion right now, which I think is a smart discussion, is how do you make this a six-year or more bill? So once they lay it down, even though it's a big price tag, it's over a period of time. So then people know they can predict local governments that are building roads and depend on some of that money as their match money can predict and plan when you're dealing with redeveloping ports or new energy sources or all the things that are important, you know, broadband, which, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago would never be an infrastructure bill. But today it's as important as electricity was back in the 50s. And so this is an important part of the next stage of development. And I think for the contractors and the people and, and really everybody, right? You wanna know kind of what the plan is. So there's good discussion about that, but I will be frank with you, I don't hear a lot in the press describing it the right way. They say, oh, it's this big old bill and this and that. Well, it's over a period of time to create a sustainable level throughout each year, and people then know where the investments are going. And, and these are investments. They're not just, people say, oh, it's spending. Well, if you invest in good broadband, for example, that reaches parts of rural you know, Alaska, Montana, Nebraska, even Virginia, for example, or West Virginia, you're going to create economic development by just that fact. Plus, you'll bring the world to people that don't have it today. And so I think that's a big piece. So so you bring up something really interesting when you said that, the, you know, the press is, is only talking about the sides of it. Then as elected officials, isn't it kind of incumbent upon them to turn around and be telling oh. the story, advocating out to the public what you just said by spreading it out over this time, by making it an investment. Uh, that's an important component. Would you agree or not? I do totally agree. I think, you know, in this kind of hyperventilated political world we live in today, everyone's trying to get what can they get, you know, on the next person or the next policy instead of, you know, my wife and I, we, we uh, we just had an update to our system on our TV and you know that you got to sometimes reset the codes. And so the code comes up and there's my news channel and off in the corner, it's the countdown clock, 10 minutes of, you know, free service. until so you got to put your code in and all that. Well, I have actually never had to update that for at least two weeks now because the news cycle and the people talking, not only the news people, but the politicians that are talking, it's the same old, who do I get next versus what I want to know. And I think the people on your podcast want to know and others, okay, tell me more about this bill. Senator X or Congresswoman Y, tell me how does this impact me? What does it mean? How will it work? I don't want you to tell me why you're mad at you know, X, Y, Z, because you think it's not the right policy. Tell me why, what you're going to do, because fundamentally you'll hear one thing from every elected official. We got to grow the economy. We got to create jobs. Okay, what don't you like in the bill? What are you going to do? And how are you going to make this happen? And I think elected officials do have an obligation. But I do believe a lot of them have just kind of lost their, their, their way in this area. And I think it's a shame because people like me, even as well-informed on politics that I think I am, I sometimes tune it out because I'm tired of the same story about the same complaints you know, and, and the scandals that you read about, there's one recently, as you know, I've had a, you know, the guy did some bad things. I got it. I don't need 12 hours telling me that. What I want to know is what's the infrastructure bill have in there for education and school systems. So I know as a local person, what do I have to advocate for to help complement that? So I get my schools getting broadband or rebuilt or fixed a leaky road. Well, and, and the issue is, 
the 12 hours of coverage really is about seven minutes of coverage repeated about every eight minutes for 12 hours. <laughs> with, with, with 10 different talking heads giving <laughs> a different opinion on the same thing. <laughs> exactly. So, right. you, so you brought up an awful lot of stuff there uh, and a lot to un try to unpack. But every day as an elected official, as when someone serves as an elected official, whether that's at the local level, uh, you know, with your Anchorage Assembly uh, as the mayor or at the state level, or in your role as a national level, one encounters their constituents who need you to do something, either right. for them directly in constituent services or to advocate for some sort of change, legislative change. So how does an elected official make decisions with so many diverse voices tugging and pulling in different directions? You know, it, that, that's a really good question because it is difficult um, because you have your own opinions usually, right? You come in the office campaigning on something, right? You talked about some position or you have some philosophical belief or, you know, some other reason you're supporting something, then you get an office. And what you can find very quickly is your opinions, may you got elected, some of them may not be fully aligned with your constituency. And this becomes a test in a lot of ways because some uh, legislate by polls, in other words, whatever they tell me, that's what I'm gonna do, or you try to see the future. And part of seeing the future means you probably can lose an election more than likely. And I've done that more than once, I've won and lost. Because sometimes, like Obamacare is a great example. I knew when I voted for that, Roger, I was probably gonna lose my election. I, I was pretty sure of it. And you know, I didn't share that with my staff and I just felt like you know, this was a big deal. Because you know, I went to a public hearing. I, remember, I will never forget this. It was in August. It was at a high school here in Anchorage, packed gymnasium or theater. And I walk in. And before I get in, the US Marshal, a friend of mine who's there, says, Hey, I just want you to know we have about 20 plainclothes people in the audience, plainclothes uh, public safety officers. I said, Why? He says, Well, we've gotten several death threats and uh, some other things. And I said, Okay. So I had to make a decision. Do I go out? and continue the public hearing and, or start the public hearing. And of course I did. But, you know, when you think of that situation, I knew, and today, if I ask folks, are you getting better healthcare, meaning that you're paying less than you would have paid before? They're also, oh, don't get rid of that. Don't get rid of, you know, they don't call it Obamacare, but affordable healthcare, don't get rid of that. But back then I couldn't even get my friends to even think about it. So. As an elected official, you have to take in all kinds of information. And it's important whoever advocates to you. If you're someone, if you, Roger, came to me and said, hey, here's an issue I'm concerned about, come in with facts, come in with information, even a good personal story about how it impacts somebody or something that shows the example of why, whatever that policy is you're, you're pitching. Uh, but don't come in there and emotional, just yell at the person. That, that is the worst thing you can do. Now, elected officials are very good at kind of absorbing that, right? You come in, you scream at them, they smile, say thank you very much, and then the door closes, and here's what they say. Don't let that person back in my office ever again. And, uh, but, you know, me, on the other hand, I enjoy going into the high controversial kind of situations because you need to grasp that information on both ends. But I think if you're an advocate, you have to recognize the stress and pressure these elected officials are on, right? You're going to someone in Washington, D.C. These people are working three, four days, flying back home, meeting constituents, they raising a family, kids. They have everything that you're dealing with as a parent, potentially. Then you add on this other stuff, two households they're maintaining. Sometimes if you're in the U.S. house, you're sleeping in the office. You got to kind of live in, I wouldn't recommend people living in their, in their shoes, but live in you know, elected official shoes for a moment and be concise. I've been in a lot of meetings where they just wander around what they're asking for and I'm like getting dizzy just thinking about it. And I usually have to interrupt, exactly say, what's your point? What are you trying to do? And even if it's negative, you know, that you don't like what I'm doing, say it, it's okay. But if I don't hear it, then you've lost your opportunity. That's right. And I think, Elected officials on, you know, Alaska, it's easier, but if you come from California to talk to your senator and house member is very difficult because it's such a big state. So treat the staff people uh, like you're treating a senator, like a congressperson. I have seen constituents come in and treat the staff like they're hired help and 
you know, they should take away the laundry and don't come back. Well, sooner or later, that staff person could be a U.S. congressperson or a senator or be in a policy position to advise a policymaker. Treat them with respect. And yes, they're going to be half your age. You know, they look like they just came out of high school or college. And yes, they are. I think the average age of an employee in Washington, D.C. is like 22 or something. But it's important that they are very knowledgeable and they can become your ally. So don't ever think that they're just buying time and brushing you off. Yeah, I, I, I want to lay down a lot of stuff there. I know, like, I know. It's just like <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I want to drill down a little bit more on the staff because I too have all too often seen, and then one of the things that I do when trying to train people is, folks, you have to have respect. And you have to have respect because they are the people that carry your laundry. Not That's everybody, right. I mean, when there are eight to 10 or 14 meetings every 15 minutes all day long within a member's office, the member cannot be in every single meeting. It's in, impossible, it's impossible and do anything else. That's right. So that staff comes back to you and says to you, wow, I either had a terrible meeting today <laughs> yep. or you won't believe what I learned today in this meeting. And this, this is important. And, and talk to me about that trust factor then. How do your okay. staff and you then deal when you know somebody who walks in the door is A, gonna tell it to you straight, but be truthful, be trustworthy and, and know, how, how does that play into that for you? So every elected official, local or state or federal are gonna be different in their styles. My style was very simple. And that was, um, I trust my employees. I, they know where I stand. So if they're talking to you, the likelihood is they're, they're, they're displaying my position. The worst situation is when a legislator, elected official, it's kind of wishy-washy. That's their MO, they don't know what they're for. Then their staffs are wishy-washy, right? So then you're not sure where they stand. With me, it was always pretty much, you know, here's where I stand, here's where I think. Um, and then they'd go and do their, do their stuff with the people who come in. Now, sometimes they'd come back and say, you know, Mark, Here's some information that you know I just learned, like you just said, we should re-examine this position. And I would take that and I'd absorb it. And sometimes I would. I'd shift my position and say, well, that you know, that's a lot of good sense. Sometimes I remember we had an issue between uh, the credit unions and the car dealerships. And this was on the interest rates and charges and so forth. And each one was telling me a story, right? So what I did said, okay, we're gonna invite you both to the same meeting. I'm not going to be whipsawed, and my staff isn't going to be whipsawed. So I brought them into the meeting. By the time we were done, we got a better understanding. They knew where I was, and we also figured out a solution. It wasn't 100% that both liked, but we got a solution. And I think it's important uh, when you're talking to a staff person and they're being wishy-washy. That doesn't mean they're wishy-washy. That may mean that's coming from the top down. If they're definitive, the odds are they're hearing that from their boss because the way it always works is even when my team, even to, to this day, are working on stuff and they'll come in and say, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, oh, yeah, I knew that. I talked to such and such. They need, they know I'm always out there, out and about talking to people. I'll be picking up the phone. And next thing I know, I get some information and they know there's a truth telling going on. And on the, on the other side is I expect they'll make some mistakes. I don't hold that against them. I'm at the top of the heap. So I'm the one that has to take the blame. And that's the way it works. But if they make a mistake, we figure it out, we move forward. But that's how you can tell when you're doing advocacy, don't blame it on the staff person, because sometimes that's coming from a higher level down to them. And they're, they're just pushing they're the it messenger. Out they're yeah, the messenger. They're the messenger. Exactly. And they're trying, and you can pick up signals when they're trying to help you help yourself, you know, kind of the Jerry Maguire routine, right? Help me help, help you. Help me help you. <laughs> yeah, and, and you'll get it. And uh, I've done that, you know, to this day, you know, I'll pick up the phone, I'll call people and former staff people or people I know. And, and uh, you know, I never treat them any different than if I picked up the phone and talked to Senator Schumer, or I talked to, you know, such and such who's a staffer working at Treasury. They all get treated the same. And my view is in life, you know, it's too short. You got to respect people for where they are and what they've done and what they've earned to that point. 
and uh, don't treat them disrespectfully. And, uh, you know, you go a long ways. It, without question, that's a great lesson in life wherever you are, whatever you do, right. whoever you're with. Um, that's right. Uh, you know, you brought up the age thing, and I, I, I want you to expound just for a half a second here sure. about literally how intelligent the staff people are at that age. Oh. What they know compared to what I probably knew at that age. Well, I know I didn't know at that <laughs> age. Uh, is is phenomenal. But I want to reassure people that that the staff are incredibly well informed. They are not only well informed, well educated, well poised. I mean, they just and when you challenge them as a boss, you say, look, I want you to take on, say, aviation as your subject matter. And they'll say, I remember this. James Feldman said to me, I don't know anything about aviation other than I fly on planes. Said, well, you're in charge of aviation. Now. And Shauna Toma, same thing. Within two or three months, they became well-versed to the point where in Congress, people were coming to my office and my other senators and saying, well, I know your staff is one of the best when it comes to aviation. Because the skill set that you're looking for with employees is one thing. That is, can you get from point A to point B? And if you can do that, you can just you can learn subject matter. But can you get things done? Can you accomplish things? But that's the key. Yeah, can you tie the knot together? That's right. Can you see kind of three steps ahead also? That's very important because you might come into my office, tell me something, and maybe it wasn't as clear, but the staff says, oh, I think I know where he was going with this. That's an important kind of uh, understanding when people come in for advocacy, because usually advocacy, it's not as clear cut as people think. You know, you're in there and you're passionate, right? You're, you're there not because someone hired you to do it. You're there because you care about it. You have a personal interest. And so when you get in there, sometimes human nature, your emotions will take command. And sometimes you'll walk out. How many times has this happened to you, Roger? It's happened to me. You walk out and you go, God, I wish I would have just said blah, 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 blah. Sure. Right? I mean, it's, and, you know, that's why when you saw me in the Senate or anywhere to this day, you'll see me with a list. And it's usually two or three things that I don't want to, if such as they're just calling me today, this is on the list. <laughs> you know, I had one of those calls today where when they call, I said, okay, three things, boom, boom, boom. I, I, I think people, the average public kind of laugh a little bit when, uh, when President Biden always reaches into his, his suit jacket and pulls out his card now and says, I've got this information on my card. I don't think there's a U.S. senator that I ever knew that didn't have that card inside their jacket That's right. that was ready to go, prepared to be able to speak and, and move forward with uh, with the, the important issues of the day. Um, I'll tell you one a story with Senator, uh, at that time he was Vice President Biden. So he was presiding one night for whatever reason, there was some big vote. And uh, the President Obama was trying to get his ATF um, a nominee, which hadn't had an ATF uh, person in that position, an alcohol, tobacco, firearms person in there for six, seven, eight years under a couple of presidents. And so this person from Minnesota was nominated and I remember I was talking to a couple senators on the side and this and that. And I said, oh, this guy might have a shot. So I go up to the podium in the Senate. If you ever watch senators, you know, where everyone, you know, the presiding officer sits. And I go up and I said, Mr. Vice President, I think you can get your nominee. But here's what, you, what I would suggest that you could do. He goes in his pocket, pulls out the card. And here's how you know he takes it seriously. He puts the card down, gets his pen out starts writing notes, writing notes. And I said, and that's all I had to do. Once he did that, I said, thank you very much. Walked off the podium. And within two and a half weeks, maybe three at the most, that person was appointed. And it worked, went right through the Senate with 60 votes. So, Excellent. you know, it's just an amazing, every elected official, you know, if they, if they tell you they're gonna mentally remember everything, you've just been put into the uh, trash bin. I'm just telling you that. That's right. That's right. You're you're in Al Capone's vault, and there's nothing in there. Um, <laughs> nothing in there. <laughs> so I like that. You you mentioned ATF, uh, mm -hmm. and and of course we know uh, our current state of some issues that are going on in the physical environment has changed right. so much around Capitol Hill due to the pandemic, the security measures, um, organizations. 
some organizations, I know for a fact, feel somewhat lost because yeah. they've always had their congressional advocacy events on Capitol Hill, and now they're floundering in their ability to still try to stay in touch, get their message out, either meet with staff or Zoom, uh, whatever the case may be. Any Anything that you think would be really important in this environment? Yeah, I, well, first off, I think this environment will change, you know, back, not totally like it was, right. but, the, you know, it will change. The other thing that I think is interesting, good, bad, or indifferent, everyone knows how to use Zoom or Teams or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, it used to be only Skype people heard about. Now, you that you know, there's selection of, and everyone knows, take the mute off, you know, <laughs> stop <laughs> muting yourself. But why that's important is because there's a couple things that have happened. First off, just from a generational standpoint, my, my mom can get on now. You know, she's never really been on these kind of technologies, but put it into the elected arena. The odds are we used to do these calls where we'd send out calls and people would get online. I'd do like a, a, a tele-town hall meeting, they call right. it. Well, now they're doing Zoom town hall meetings, which you get two kind of bites of the apple. You get the visual, which you might be able to engage in, but you also get the chat line. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, if you're advocacy and you're trying to figure out well, how do we do this, how do we make this happen, it's actually easier to some degree to call a senator or a congressperson or something and say, look, we just need you for 15 minutes on our Zoom. You pick the time. We'll do it whenever. Yep. Because now us. they can squeeze it in between votes or they don't have to have a specific time. There's some unusual flexibility. The challenge of that is everyone's working like 24 hours now, which is a slight problem. I do think groups that want to get in front of their congressional people or their mayor or whatever, those town halls that they're doing now by video, you got to engage quickly. Second, um, when they're at meetings, you tag into those meetings. I do it all the time. I see when they're having meetings with some other groups, and I go, I sign up. You know, I said, why not? You know, and then I get to be in that group and listen to what they're talking about. Um, but as a group in those fly ins, you know, you got to rearrange the thinking. You might, for example, say, OK, the Western states will just say if you say you're the general contractor, Western states are going to have a, instead of a fly in a video in and they're going to ask senators and house members from that whole region to figure out some times that work for them. And why that's important is because here's what is now happening. People used to say, well, I just got to go see my congressperson. Actually, everything's national. You know, your road in Topeka, Kansas is as important as a road in Alaska. And everyone cares because everyone has to vote on these things. So it's forcing people to make new engagements that they never did before. And I think that's very positive. But I do think, you know, it's a different world. I was on a Zoom call a couple of days ago, just myself and Gina McCarthy, and she was having lunch. She said, would you mind if I had lunch? I didn't care. But because I'm talking to someone that's pretty powerful in the White House about climate issues and for Alaska, that's a big deal. So I think for fly-ins, I think we're not going to see that happen for a little while, but tag on to what you see going on around your community, figure out how you can create the event to invite them to call in my video or call. You know, sometimes they can't do video because maybe they're in a car, but it's a lot easier. And I think more people are comfortable with it than ever before. That, that is, I can just tell in some of the groups I've been, I've been on one call recently where it's 400 people. I was shocked. I couldn't get that many at the meetings, you know, but they're calling in from all over wherever they are. So, well, we had a, I had a client of mine that every year I've done their, uh, their uh, legislative fly in and they've always averaged 125, 140 people. And then this past year, they had 1,600 people registered for it because yeah. now they don't have to take the time to jump on a plane, pay for a hotel room, pay for a flight, take three days off to come in and have three or four appointments uh, in yeah. one day. They can participate at different levels. And, and I love your idea of, of stagger it, regionalize it. Uh, that helps other people understand other issues in other states as well. And so right. I think that that's I think that's a really good solution. And see, that's one of the reasons you bring a smart guy like Mark on your say, podcast. When, when is the smart guy showing up? I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> He's here. He's here. Okay, one more thing. Here. 
what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word advocacy? Be passionate, remember your issue, keep your facts straight, and always leave with a smile, not with an angry attitude. <laughs> Wonderful. Mark, any final, any final thoughts? I just say first, Rod, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for getting people to be advocates. That's what makes this country what it is. If you don't advocate for your cause, no one knows your cause exists. And I tell people that all the time. The first advocacy is vote. Second advocacy is go talk to your folks who are elected at every level, because you never know when some guy who's 26 years old and sitting on the Anchorage Assembly might be a US Senator. <laughs> so. I think I know of a guy like that. <laughs> you know, and and it and it's funny. You're absolutely right. I do I do a little bit uh, when I speak where I will say, the beginning of the Constitution. It doesn't begin with I the King. It doesn't begin with me the President. It doesn't begin with we the Congress. It begins with we the people. It's our That's role. Right. It's our responsibility. Mark, I can't, Mr. Senator, I can't <laughs> thank you enough for the time that you've given the audience, the people, and the reassurance that being an advocate is a really good, key, important role in how our government works. Uh, how can people reach Northern Compass Group for any more, more information? Well, we're on, you go just type it in Northern Compass Group and uh, dot com and you can get our web page you can see all our people that work there and we have our email on there and love to talk to folks and if there's any business interest obviously we'd love to have some but northerncompassgroup.com and we do business all around the country and literally around the globe so thank you roger for the opportunity and i'm glad you're getting people riled up and getting them focused and giving them the tools they need to, to again like i said make this country great we can always improve from day to day no matter where we are I, I, I greatly appreciate that, Mark. That's a wrap of today's very insightful conversation with former Senator Mark Baggage, President and CEO of the Northern Compass Group. Uh, thank you so much for being on your show. I wish you well and all the best. And the next time you're in Arizona, make sure we get a chance to connect. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Now it's time for the advocacy engagement tip. Today's tip is one of five reasons your supporters do not participate in your grassroots advocacy efforts. It's fear. People fear that they will not know as much about their issues as the elected official or their staff know. There is a fear of not knowing how to answer their questions. Thus, fear of being embarrassed. They fear that elected officials and staff don't want to meet with them to hear their concerns. Now, we in the advocacy arena know that this is not true and is, in fact, the polar opposite. They want and need to hear from you. One way to remove fear is advocacy training. Do you have enough training in place to remove fear? We're proud to have Rap Index as a sponsor to the show. Let's face it, today's advocacy arena is just plain noisy. Organizations are stretched. You need every advantage to make sure your issue gets the attention it deserves and your voice heard. The Rap Index is the best way to do just that by finding your stakeholders' relationships and engagement power. Get past the noise. Know who your people know. Go to rapindex.com. That's R A P index.com and tell them Roger sent you for a special offer. A few quick notes to end this episode. In upcoming episodes, you will be treated to great interviews from leaders in the world of politics, associations, and nonprofit causes. If you like today's podcast, head over to where 
you find your podcasts and subscribe to the Voices in Advocacy podcast today. A big thank you to today's distinguished guest. We at Voices in Advocacy work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. That's it for this episode of Voices in Advocacy. Remember, you have the power to be an effective, influential advocate. Now go out and make it a better world. We hope you enjoyed today's Voices in Advocacy podcast and look forward to you joining us again next week. To learn more about Voices in Advocacy, go to our website, voicesinadvocacy.com.